In the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Amen. The Word of God is for us this morning. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ, in the beginning, the Christian church was almost exclusively Jewish. Controversially, then, Jesus' apostles took the gospel, the good news of a Jewish Messiah, this Jewish Jesus, to non-Jews, to Gentiles. Peter goes to Cornelius. Christians scattered by persecution go to Antioch, and they are preached to Greeks also. And, of course, there's Paul, apostle to the Gentiles. Over time, the demographics of the Christian church shifted dramatically from being that of mostly Jewish to mostly Gentile. And along with this shift in demographics came an interesting shift in attitude toward Jews. Almost forgetting that Jesus himself was Jewish, forgetting their Jewish background, the Jewish scriptures that they hold in common that we still have, the Christian church soon began to see Jews as the great opponent and enemy of all things Christian. Most famously, or perhaps infamously, the church began to refer to Jews as deicides, God-killers, Christ-killers. I'm not here to blame the Christian church for anti-Semitism or the Holocaust. The Christian church didn't invent racism. The Christian church didn't invent the Nazi party. But we can't deny that through history there runs a line of this particular kind of racism in the Christian church, anti-Semitism. Why else then in the 1960s, at the Second Vatican Council, a meeting of Roman Catholic bishops, did they have to specifically and formally define for the faithful that it's not a good idea to call Jews Christ-killers? And remember, a few years back, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, raised huge alarms of controversy because of the alleged anti-Semitism of his film, how he portrayed Jews, including his use of the line from the Gospels, let his blood be upon us and upon our children, which, under pressure from the Vatican, he eventually edited out of the film. I wonder, though, if a strain of this infects us as well. Over the years, now and again, I have come face to face with the word Christ killer. Thankfully, not in a form that led me to believe mass killings and ghettos and pogroms were coming, but still an attempt to pin all the blame on the Jews. Forgetting what even Mel Gibson remembered. We killed Christ. Remember, in that film, he played an uncredited role as the soldier nailing Jesus to the cross, a gesture symbolically saying, I'm guilty too. We would be best served then to remove the phrase Christ killer from our vocabulary. And instead, when we talk about the Jews, when we think about the Jews, whisper in awestruck wonder, Blessed art thou among the nations, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. For that very reason, Paul begins the ninth chapter of Romans this way, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. He sees what God hath wrought through the Jews. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, 
Just a few chapters earlier in Romans 3, after Paul had eliminated circumcision as just something superficial, not a a work that earns you any favor from God, Paul asked the logical question that flows from his words about circumcision. Well, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. Think of that. Out of all the peoples on earth, out of all the nations, only about the Jewish nation does God say, Jacob, I have loved. The glory of the Lord led them out of Exodus in Egypt. The glory of the Lord dwelled with them in the tabernacle and the temple. The glory of the Lord led them through the desert in pillar of cloud and fire. To them God spoke. With them God made his covenant. All nations will be blessed through you. No one else had a Mount Sinai moment. No one else had the Ark of the Covenant. No one else had the temple and her sacrifices. No one else has the fathers that they have, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Solomon. To them first did God speak his promises, his good news, and he spoke his glorious words, his gospel, in their language, in Hebrew. It's in Hebrew tones that we first hear God's promises. The promise to send a son to crush the devil. The promise of a servant who, though despised and rejected, would carry our sins. The servant who, though crushed, destroyed, wounded for us, would bring us the light of life, would bring us justification. Just as Paul says about women in 1 Timothy 2, they will be saved through childbearing. So too we can speak of the Jews For out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over all Israel. Blessed is the fruit of the Jewish womb, Jesus, our Jewish Messiah. No wonder then that this weighed so heavily on Paul's heart. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Because everywhere Paul goes, the sad truth confronts him. The Jews reject the fruit of their womb, Jesus. From city to city, from synagogue to synagogue, almost all Paul sees from his brothers in the flesh, his Jewish brothers, is rejection. Rabidly they reject Christ. They even follow him from city to city so that they can rabidly reject Christ and rabidly cling to a righteousness, not the one that comes from God, but a righteousness of their own, a self-chosen righteousness of works, of obeying the law. And while Paul laments this sad development here in Romans 9, he then goes on to talk about grace. He begins an extended essay about grace and God's gifts in Romans 9, 10, and 11, and it's a necessary talk. The Jews grew overly proud of their heritage. Ah, we are sons of Abraham. John the Baptist dealt with that kind of thinking. Jesus dealt with that kind of thinking, and Paul deals with that kind of thinking, reminding his Roman readers, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Already, outside the promised land, as Israel sits in the desert waiting to enter what God was going to give them, God has to talk with them, he has to deal with them, he has to kind of back them off this cockiness and arrogance. Don't think that you're coming into this promised land because you're so special and wonderful and righteous. You're not. You're getting this land because I picked you. I chose you. I adopted you. I, the Lord your God, the God who has mercy upon whom he will have mercy, compassion upon whom he'll have compassion. Throughout this long essay on grace and God's choice and God's giving, Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul presses this point home, using especially the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, and especially the prophet Isaiah. Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will be saved. And again, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. And once more, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. God's grace met with rejection. The Jews, zealous as they were for salvation, 
turned from God's grace and they turned to their own self-chosen works, to their own way of saving themselves, not to mention turning to the worship of false gods just like the nations and turning to lives of depravity and sin just like the nations from whom God was trying to separate them. Paul's brothers, the Jews, tried to give themselves grace instead of receiving it from God. And yet God still poured out grace All day long, I've held out my hands to them. Paul picks up the Old Testament lesson we heard today in in part of this essay on grace. These words from 1 Kings 19. He talks about it in in chapter 11 of Romans, the story about Elijah. Driven into exile by Ahab and Jezebel, Paul sounds, or Elijah sounds decidedly not like Paul. He doesn't go up to the Lord and say, curse me, God, save the nation. No, no, no. He says, kill them. They've rejected you. They've driven me out. They're trying to kill me, Lord. And God says, no. I have a remnant. I have reserved to myself 7,000. More than that, he goes on to tell Elijah how he has lined up for the people, his people, kings and prophets, to preserve this remnant, to extend this remnant. A remnant chosen by grace, God's grace. So that Paul concludes, and if by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Sadly, we know the rest of the story. We know that Israel, God's root and God's branch, God's picked and chosen people, get removed. He cuts the vine away. He removes the branch. And then we see God graft in a new branch. He grafts in the Gentiles. He grafts in the non-Jews. He grafts in us, bringing the good news of a Jewish Messiah, the good news of Jesus, to the world. We must both learn from our Jewish predecessors to treasure this gift of grace that God has given us. But also we must be wary. We must be wary of showing contempt for Jews, treating Jews with contempt. As Paul warns us in Romans 11, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I could be grafted in, granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. And again, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? In other words, Paul tells his Gentile readers, he tells us to remember, remember, you are not the natural branches of this tree, this vine, the Holy Christian Church. God came to the Jews first, and then the Gentiles. And God still wants the Jews. Paul says that a major part of his mission, a purpose for going to non-Jews, in addition to, of course, bringing the good news of Jesus, of God's grace and forgiveness to us, a major purpose of his ministry to the Gentiles is to arouse envy, to arouse jealousy among the Jews, that they might see God's gift of grace and that God might graft them back into the vine. And again, it's grace, all grace, grace alone. The Jews did nothing and have done nothing to deserve God giving them anything, to deserve God doing anything for them, to deserve receiving anything. Neither have we. Writing to some Gentile believers in the city of Corinth, some Gentile believers who are acting crazy, Paul asks the Corinthian believers a question. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? The Jews, as Scripture teaches us, grew proud of their heritage. They grew proud of being chosen. They grew proud of all those things Paul listed that God had given them. And they forgot. They forgot that everything they had, they received. Everything they had, God gave them by grace. 
we can forget just as easily. We have nothing that we did not receive. Our being here this morning gives nothing to God. Our membership in this church gives nothing to God. Our offerings give nothing to God. Our baptism gives nothing to God. The purity of our doctrine gives nothing to God. The proper observance of the sacrament gives nothing to God. And yet we treat them like they do. We go around saying, Lord, Lord, how wonderful. Look at me, one of your chosen people. Look, look at what I've done for you today. And we forget. We forget that God gives God gives everything. The God who mercies whom he will mercy. The God who has compassion on whom he will have compassion. And in so doing, in so forgetting, we can easily be cut off, easily be removed from the vine, just as Paul's Jewish brothers were. If we turn grace, if we turn faith, if we turn the righteousness that comes from God into a merit that we earn, instead of a gift that God gives. Repeatedly in his writings, Luther compares the preaching of the word, the ministry that Paul did, the ministry that the church does with the passing rain shower. And he said, when it's gone, it's gone. And then you have nothing. And then having nothing, maybe you're like that rich man in hell, burning, suffering, and begging, pleading with with Father Abraham in heaven for just one drop of water, for just one more taste, one more refreshing taste of the word, calling out, saying, I want that. And as he said to the Jews, so he still says today, the word is near you. All those advantages that the Jews had, that God gave them, he gives them to you in Christ. The adoption the glory, the covenant, the law, the worship, the promises, and most vitally, that thing that holds them all together, the thing that brings all these things to fruition, the sum that is greater than the parts, Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. The threat of removing the word of God from us calls out to reach for it all the more. We heard Isaiah promise about this last week, didn't we? Come, Isaiah said, come, all you who thirst. Come, buy wine and milk. Come, buy it without money, without cost. We have seen Paul in Romans. We see Paul, we'll still see him in the next few weeks, laying out this wine and milk, setting this table, laying out the very same wine and milk that God laid out before our Jewish brothers. The same wine and milk that they spurned. And God says it's still here right here in front of you, because the Word of God does not fail. The Word of God does its job. It sets before you, it brings to you, it gives you what you need, what you must have, and it is Christ, and it is the love of God in Christ. And the Word of God reverses things from all arrow up. Lord, look at what I've done for you today, and makes it all arrow down. My children, look at the gifts I have to give to you. And what God has to give is glorious. It is wine, it is milk, it is a rain shower of his grace. He gives us the bread of life for us to eat. And when we eat it, we eat it into eternal life. He gives us the water of life, which becomes a spring welling up into us, into eternal life. For he gives, 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 not owes, but gives us his son, his only son, not sparing him, but spearing him to a cross. For you for your salvation, choosing us, adopting us, picking us, cleansing us with his forgiveness at the font, feeding us with forgiveness in the meal of his son's body and blood, preaching us forgiven in his word, so that he says, just as Paul said, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off for the sake of my brothers. And what Paul could only wish, God gives God cursed himself. God cut off his own son for the sake of us. God brought his son back to life for the sake of us. For all men, 
first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. God gives. We receive. And in Christ we are saved. Amen. Please stand as we continue with the Te Deum. We pray.